tried that. One, two. Let's see if that's any better. That's a little better. All right, everybody, I'm glad to see you. Welcome. Welcome to those watching online. Before we start, we'll start with a prayer, but before we start, um, let me peel back the curtain a little bit so you can see kind of some of the how this particular sausage is made. Um, we revolve our adult forum around big events in the life of the parish. For example, the annual meeting is in two weeks. And there's no adult forum on annual meeting Sunday because the annual meeting is the adult forum. Uh, and then after that, a big event, uh, Laura Walsh is going to lead an interfaith series. That is part of her expertise. And she, as you know, is an excellent teacher. So we'll have the benefit of Laura Walsh leading a four-week series on interfaith issues. Um, but if you back up from uh, on the other side of that four-week series... We have a tippy speaker, and then after that, Lent starts, so that's a good time to start a new series. So if you work your way back, you end up with two weeks here between the new year and Laura's series, and we need something, and I'm hungry to talk about Hagar. Hagar um, has come up in our daily office readings, or is coming up in our daily office readings soon. Um, it also might be a good uh, antecedent to the interfaith uh, conversation, though I don't think Laura's going to focus on... Uh, just on Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. But uh, we're talking about a central figure in the life of not only our tradition, but other traditions as well. And in particular, what I'd like to look into are some of the ways that perhaps we have limited our understanding of not only Hagar, but because of that, also our understanding of some of the other traditions that we, uh, that we have connections with. So today we start a two-week series on Hagar, and I've subtitled it Mother of a Nation, and we will see why after a while. If you're watching online, you can see the handout on the screen. If you're here in person, handouts are by the coffee pot if you don't have one. But let's start with this prayer. I wrote this collect last night. Uh, some of you were a part of our collect class, so maybe you can hear the five elements of a collect here. And I wonder if after our series you would write something different. I'm not sure, but let's pray this collect for our series out loud together. Let us pray. Merciful God, you are the one who sees us and hears our cry. Give us the faith of Hagar, whose obedience enabled the birth of a nation, that we may follow the path you have set before us and persevere in the face of adversity. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, who lives and reigns in union with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. What do you know about Hagar? What do you remember about Hagar? Before we read any of the text, what do you, what do you remember about Hagar? Elizabeth and I were talking last night about this series. I've taught a couple of classes, not just on Hagar, but Hagar becomes a really, just a very memorable figure in discussions of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, and, and some of the connections. But, but on your own, what do you remember? What do you know about Hagar? When you hear Hagar, what, what do you think of? What event, what names, what circumstances do you think of? Oh, and um, let me see if I can get a volunteer to run the microphone around. I'm, I'm a little rusty. Elizabeth, are you going to run the microphone around? Thank you. Yeah, I'm a little rusty. I haven't done this in two weeks, three weeks. All right, so what do you remember? When you hear Hagar, what do you remember? And Elizabeth will bring you the microphone. Eileen, do you have, was that a hand? Was that a, Eileen has something. Eileen, here, this microphone will help those who are watching online hear what you have to say as well. Otherwise, they just sort of stare at me and wonder why I'm not saying anything. Eileen. Yeah, I, I just, you know, what I always think about her is she's um, a slave and... and And she does what she's told. I mean, basically, yeah. Sarah says, 
go with him because I yeah. can't get pregnant. And then she does, and then she kicks her out, basically. Yeah, yeah. A slave, obedient, suffers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what else do you think of when you think of Hagar? Do any of you think of Galatians? I, I bet Eleanor Neal thinks of Galatians. I'm not sure about that. But Galatians, uh, part of our Reformed tradition, Paul has a lot to say about, about Hagar and Sarah, about Ishmael and Isaac. And so Paul does his own kind of midrash. He does his own interpretation of this event in light of the particular community he was writing to and the particular agenda he had. Um, and I think whether we are conscious of it or not, I think Paul and Galatians have shaped in large measure how we as a church receive the story of Hagar. Paul tells us one was good and one was bad, one was right and one was wrong, which served his aim in the day, but I think might, might reflect only a part of what, what we need to hear from Hagar. Yeah, what else? Anything else that you think of when you think of Hagar? Let's, let's listen to part of the story and I'm going to stop us halfway through Genesis chapter 16 uh, and ask some questions. I've, I've written a bunch of questions on the sheet, more than normal, but I, I do so not because we need to tackle all of them, but because there's a lot to think about when we think of uh, Hagar. So who would read for us first um, from your handout? Um, and uh, Adeline will bring the microphone to you. Who would read for us Genesis chapter 16 verses 1 through 6? There's a handout by the coffee pot. Make sure you get a handout when you come in and a cup of coffee if you want it. But who would read that for us, please? Thank you. And you'll notice that I've chosen, excuse me, I'm sorry, I've chosen the contemporary English version, which conveys a couple of words that I feel are really important for us to hear in this translation. I'll say more about that in a minute, but go, go ahead. One through six. Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to have children. Since she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar, Sarai said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from giving birth, so go to my servant. Maybe she will provide me with children. Abram did just as Sarai said. After Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife Sarai took her Egyptian servant Hagar to give and gave her to her husband, Abram, as his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she became pregnant. But when she realized that she was pregnant, she no longer respected her mistress. Sarai said to Abram, this harassment is your fault. I allowed you to embrace my servant, but when she realized she was pregnant, I lost her respect. Let the Lord decide who is right, you or me, Abram said to Sarai. Since she's your servant, do whatever you wish to her. So Sarai treated her harshly, and she ran away from Sarai. Thank you. All right, before we tackle any of the questions I've given you, what do you want to ask? What do you want to ask of the text? What do you want to know more about? When you, when you hear this story, which I bet is, is starting to become a little familiar to you, we've only gotten half of it so far, but, but what, what do you want to know? What do you want to hear more about in this story? What are your wonderings? And again, Adeline will come and bring you the microphone so that we can all hear you. What do you think? Men taking several wives. Mm -hmm. Well, here you have a wife giving her husband yeah. another wife. Yeah. With so, I mean, it turns the tables. Yeah. What's right? What's I mean? Is there a right or wrong? It is God's will. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. You know, there's so many different perspectives. One is just what the text tells us, right? But there's another question that I would ask, which is, who's telling the story? Like, who gets to tell the story this way? Why are, why are they telling the story this way? What if, what if Sarah had told the story? Would this have sound differently than this version? What if Hagar had told the story? Would, would that have sounded... Like, if, if, if that was the perspective, I, I wonder. But yeah, you know... In, even though our, our institution of marriage and uh, uh, polygamy or polyamorous relationships uh, were certainly different in the ancient world uh, than they are in our current uh, culture and society, still human beings 
feel a lot of this, right? And so we don't have to know everything about ancient uh, Canaanite traditions to know there's some, there's some tension there between Sarai and Abram and now Hagar. And we also, I hear you in your question, recognizing it's, it's not simple because of some hierarchical relationships that are, that are there, both gender related, but also property ownership, like the ownership of a human being. Yeah. Yeah. What else do you want to know? What else do you want to draw out of this text? Or, or what catches your attention? Yeah. Simply why she uh, gave the uh, mistress to her husband yeah. and did not expect anything to happen. Yeah. Huh. Yes. She, yes. I wonder what she expected. Yeah. Yeah, Eileen. Part of the reason that I said what I said earlier is because it reminded me of the book The Red Tent, which I read a long, long time ago. But, I mean, this whole idea that, that that's what women are supposed to do is have children, and she'd been unsuccessful all this time. So, yeah, I mean, it must be heartbreaking to all of a sudden give this woman to your husband, and all of a sudden she can bear a child. Yeah. So, I don't yeah. know. I loved that book. Yeah. Thank you. George, up front. Hold on just a second. There are people watching online and they won't hear you if, if you don't use the microphone. So there you go. Thank you. You know, it's hard in, um, when you look at a hierarchical um, ordering like they had in the Old Testament, you had some, it doesn't seem just from our perspective at all. You have some guy bossing everybody else around, the, the patriarch, then the wife, then the patriarch, the children. It's a, it's a disaster. And then you have the second wife, etc. So it's hard to dis- uh, differentiate when you have a hierarchical, which is an unjust thing to us in the first place, to find justice within that. But inherently, I believe that she expected the new concubine or uh, foster mother to have respect, to order their also to be consistent with that hierarchical system, which is based on respect. Yeah. It's not based on I'm the most powerful and you're out not, but rather once you have those established then you have a certain rules and uh, certain ethics, morals that go with it. And that's what I think the violation was, that all of a sudden the person who's given this gift of being the foster mother, which is a great honor of this patriarch, to just disrespect, to throw all, all the hierarchy away once she's taken advantage of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I join you in asking what isn't said in the story? Like, you know, Hagar, Hagar might have been property. She might have been a slave or a servant woman. Uh, we'll talk more about her identity and her, 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 her personhood in a little bit. But from one angle, she is able to become what Sarai is not able to be, which is a, a child bearer. And, and that's wrapped up in promise. Like God, God has said to Abram, I will give you offspring They've, they've set out on this journey. They've left family because of this promise. And Abram, as we'll see in a little bit, is 86 years old. And so is Sarai, why does Sarai feel pressured? Is this Abram? Is this God? Is this, does she feel one thing and then feel something else? And, and how are those roles replaced and subverted? Absolutely, yes. So look at some of the questions I've asked, and I'll answer some of them, but some of them I, I, I can't answer if, if you remember the story of Abram, right? Remember there was a time when they traveled from the land of Ur, the Chaldeans, into, uh, towards Canaan, and they went through Egypt. And do you remember what, what Abram said to his wife, Sarai, when they came into Pharaoh's land? Pharaoh, mighty, powerful Pharaoh. Um, Abram said to his wife, I want you to pretend to be my sister so that the Bible doesn't tell us this explicitly, so that, Ab- so that Pharaoh will take you as one of his wives, and so he won't kill me or steal my property. So I want you, he told his wife, I want you to become the sexual object of Pharaoh so that I can get through here okay. And we don't hear Sarah say anything in that episode, um, but you could make a movie about it, and I bet you could convey a lot without anything uh, being said. But what what the Bible doesn't tell us, but what maybe I think is reasonable for us to imagine is that somehow in that context of Sarai belonging to Pharaoh as a sexual object, Hagar somehow comes back 
to Sarai. Uh, the, I've used as one of my resources uh, Will Gaffney, Dr. Gaffney's uh, book called Womanist Midrash. Um, uh, Gaffney, Dr. Gaffney will be one of our tippy speakers about 14 months from now. Um, and this is one of, her, one of her books, probably the book that got her the uh, sort of her seminal work, if you will, though her A Womanist Lectionary is, is uh, recently published, and I bet we'll hear some about that when she's with us. But uh, Dr. Gaffney notes that perhaps as Pharaoh discovers the mistake that he's made, the deception, um, uh, that he, in fact, maybe gave to Sarai and to Abram this slave woman, or princess, depending on uh, how our imagination runs, to be property. And so maybe there's an exchange that Abram is now doubly responsible for this unsettled relationship. So imagine he convinced his wife to lie so that she became a sexual object so that he could escape unscathed. And then now uh, Hagar is sort of compensation for this uh, for this uh, fraud, if you will, uh, Pharaoh uh, was was punished by God for what had happened. Um, Pharaoh says, "Get out of here!" And by the way, take maybe take with you Hagar. Um, uh, maybe she uh, will uh, will help you look more favorably upon me. So there's all this there's this complicated bit, and so it, not uh, part of this story then is Egypt and Israel, and as we'll see at the end, Egypt and Israel will eventually have another kind of relationship of, of, uh, of slavery, of imprisonment. And so there are some antecedents to that great story already unraveling. Um, Hagar, um, Richard Billingsley noted on a Facebook last night that, um, that Hagar is a name that might mean uh, foreigner. Um, if it's from Hebrew, we're not sure it's from Hebrew, but if it's from Hebrew, uh, the ha root is like a from and the gar root is a, a flight. And so she is one from flight. Maybe refugee would be a better word for that. But, but stranger or foreigner is likely a, a part of her name. And yet in the Muslim tradition, you might know that she's not called Hagar. She's remembered as a Hajar, Hajar. Um, uh, and and we're not, again, we're not exactly sure what the root of that is. But some Semitic languages, Gaffney notes, uh, suggest that that might be princess. So maybe the one who was a princess in Egypt became uh, defined by her otherness, her foreign nature in this relationship. She's not part of Abraham and Sarai in that community. She's a foreigner. She's a stranger. And so every time her name is said, imagine what it means for your name to be, you don't belong here. Right? I mean, imagine if you, and we can't imagine, as Gaffney points out, we can't imagine that any Egyptian mother would name her child stranger. That doesn't make sense. So, so however she got this name, it seems likely that we've, we've placed this name upon her. I wonder what her name was before we started calling her stranger, uh, sort of a sub, almost a subhuman uh, name. So just a- allow those layers to, to fill our understanding of this story. A um, couple more observations, then I'm going to stop and ask for your reflections. Um, notice that Sarai, the, at least the biblical text says to us, that Sarai, in verse 2, says to her husband, maybe she, my servant, will provide me with children. Just hold on to that for a little bit. Maybe my servant will provide me with children. A a surrogate, if you will. Um, That maybe Abram and Sarai will have this child who is provided through the surrogacy of Hagar. Maybe. Um, But we see already, even before the birth, that there's an upturning of the relationship uh, which, which perhaps uh, makes that impossible. Um, also, nobody asked Hagar. Right? Hagar doesn't get an opinion about this. When you're a slave, you don't even own your own body. Right? When nobody asked Hagar if she was willing to do this, she becomes, by, not by choice, she becomes not only the sexual object of her mistress's husband, but also the bearer of his child. Um, we've got a history of that in our own country and in our own culture, but it's important for us to remember that even though the text doesn't say that, she had no voice. She had no opinion in this matter. Sarai seems to be an agent here, is portrayed as an agent, but but notably Hagar's agency is absent in the text. Uh, Two more things that I want to draw your attention to. Um, Notice in verse 5, the very end of verse 5, Sarai says to Abram, let the Lord decide who is right, you or me. What's God's response to that? If, if God said anything, we don't hear it. It's silence. 
Um, Gaffney wonders if maybe the reason there's silence is because God recognized that the brokenness wasn't involving God. This was a brokenness. This was a brokenness of human origin that needed human resolution, right? In other words, y'all got like kind of like when your kids come to you yelling and screaming about he hit me, no, she hit me first, and you say sort it out, right? Good, good luck with that. I'm not judging between y'all. Y'all, y'all got to figure that out. Interestingly enough, Sarai appeals to Yahweh, the Lord, who had made the promise to Abram. And, and God doesn't say anything about this. Instead, Abram is the one who responds. And he says, which is, I think, just what a wonderfully um, weak statement. Um, uh, you, she's your servant. You do whatever you want. I don't, I, I'm already up to my neck in this one. You, you, figure, you figure it out. And, and maybe if you're angry at her, you won't be so angry at me anymore. Take out your anger on her so that maybe we can be back in good graces. Because I kind of miss you, uh, wife of mine, right? So it just so much is not spoken but this text contains all of that, all of those human emotions that we can imagine it would, it would be when we've got a, a marriage that is then introduced to a mis, a, an affair and a mistress, a surrogate, um, who doesn't have voice and agency, who then begins to take ownership over this in a way that is threatening to her mistress, and that begins to unravel a marriage. And God is present, but God isn't acting in any way just sort of letting them sort it out. So let me, let me hear from you. What do you hear? What do you notice? As we, as we hear the text and ponder it, what begins to bubble up for you? What are you hearing in the story of Hagar? And Adeline will come to you with a microphone if you'll raise your hand. What are you hearing? What are you hearing? I think, I think you got something great. Yeah, right here up front. Hi. One of the things I took from this is that um, it's kind of twofold of sorry and everything because I think she started to get jealous. And so it wasn't necessarily um, Hagar's fault about that. And then she just yeah. reacted very harshly to her in jealousy. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, sometimes we're human beings and sometimes, sometimes it's, our jealousy is not a choice. Sometimes we just can't, we can't, we can't live in the house that our new spouse lived in with his first wife or her first husband, right? We just, we got to get a clean start. We know, we, we can imagine that. We can feel that. Imagine then what it's like to see this woman giving your husband what you haven't been able to give her what he's told you is what God has insisted be true, right? You know that. Talk about a. I mean, Sarah is Sarah in, in in many ways is is victim here, a different sort of victim than than Hagar is for sure. But yeah. Right, what else do you notice? What else do you hear? The the biblical. I mean, imagine reading this from both sides of the story. Right? Imagine, this read, imagine reading this from the perspective of we, we know that God's great promise, covenant with Abraham, must be fulfilled through a child. And because we are spiritual descendants of the Jewish tradition, imagine recognizing that our whole identity as a people and our relationship with God is impossible if it weren't for the promise made to Abraham being fulfilled. So when we read it from, from the contemporary setting, we read back into it, it has to, that promise has to find a fulfillment. But imagine reading it also from the other side. Imagine that as you're turning the pages from Genesis 12 to 13 to 14 to 15 and now 16, you've been journeying with Abram and Sarai for a while. You've, been way, you've heard the promise, you know the covenant, you know that God is going to make of Abraham uh, descendants as numerous as the stars in the heavens, that, that Abraham will become a light to the nation so that all people might know who Israel's God is, who Abraham's God is. So we're turning these pages and we're seeing every turn of the page is later in life. He's, he's now 86. And you've got to wonder, when's, when's this promise going to come to fulfillment? Did, didn't we hear that? You know, didn't we know that? And so when we encounter Genesis 16, it feels, like, it feels like this isn't just an accident. It feels like there's all the, the destiny of a, of a people um, for generations and generations hangs in the balance. 
And that, that helps me hear Abraham, Sarai, and Hagar very differently and their roles very differently. It's easy for me instead to hear this knowing it's not going to be Hagar's child, it's going to be Sarai's child. It's not going to be Ishmael, it's going to be Isaac. But, but up to this point, that, that, that isn't true yet. I mean, we, we don't know that to be true. So just the, the, the beautiful narrative tension um, that complicates this story. Yeah, other, other, other reflections. Yeah, George, thank you. Sorry about that, my bad man. Um, it reminds me of the Resident Trilogy where Orestes, um, if he doesn't avenge his uh, father's death, uh, will be condemned by the Furies. And if he does avenge his father's death, he's going to be condemned by the Furies. So you have a double bind thing where the rules, the old traditional rules, uh, aren't going to fit the case. Uh, and there has to be a moral decision made here. In, in that case, I guess it was the Apollo. But the same thing here in the sense that uh, each of these persons, these agents, has a right. In other words, they're, they're in the right in, to, in their own context. Uh, the wronged mistress who has a, not just a, a new uh, mother who will give her a child, but a rival. Well, that's no fun after how many years of marriage. And uh, from his standpoint, well, this is what has to be done. This is what has to be done historically. We have to have another child. And from uh, the other, the, the interloper's standpoint, she's, hey, she's, she's providing a service and so forth that she wants a few, you know, give me some credit here. So then, as you said, the, the, the Reverend, as the long, in view of the context of what there is, you have conflict of immediate laws that apply to immediate cases, you have to get an overarching law. We have to interpret an overarching law that, to find the resolution. And that's, of course, got, done through God, but it has to be a reinterpretation or an expansion of man's knowledge of God's uh, hmm. will. Yeah, thank you. Yes, and sometimes, sometimes I, I think I, I have a tendency to approach the Bible um, and forget just how spirit-filled its, its authorship and revision and interpretation have been over the millennia and understand, I feel a, a call to re-understand the ways in which this story has been so fully shaped to reveal to us far more than just the story itself. Uh, for example, in verse 2, notice Notice th these are not accidental words. Notice what Sarai, knowing it or not, notice what Sarai says, the Lord has kept me from giving birth. Right? So she invokes God. God you know, not only, I know that God has promised it, and yet somehow God is present in my barrenness. And so rather than to say, so God's going to fix it, she says, maybe I'll fix it. Um, go into my servant, if you will. Or maybe another way to read that is, maybe the Lord has kept her from giving birth for another purpose, maybe not the birth of Isaac, which will come, the child of the promise, to use the language that, that Paul will use, but instead an, the nation that, that stems from Ishmael, as we'll see. So there's so much, so much in this text. The two words that uh, I want to highlight for you, the reason I chose the CEV, um, one of them is uh, here in verse 4. Um, I thought the, the way that the CEV translates uh, no longer respected her mistress um, a lot of English translations give us looked with contempt upon her. And I think if we're going to hear that contempt, we need to hear it the way it might have been shared about 80 years ago, right? Not, not the way I often use contempt as in sort of hatred for, but to kind of hold in disdain or to have lost respect for. So I think that's an important understanding about the reversal of those relationships. One, one that was the lower is now and since the higher. Um, you know, only those with any kind of authority over you, does their disdain matter to you, right? You know, um, uh, so, so the fact that she looks with contempt is, is, re reflects a, a reorientation of that relationship. And the other bit that I wanted to highlight is right here in verse 6, when Sarai treated her harshly, and I think that's an important word for us to hold on to as we read, read the second half. Let's read the second half. I'm going to turn to the next page on the back part of the page. And, um, and uh, who would read for us, please? The rest of that text, before you get to the bulleted part, verses 7 through, 5, uh, through 16, who would read that for us, pretty please? 
Thank you, David. I appreciate that. Here it comes. The Lord's messenger found Hagar at a spring in the desert, the spring on the road to Shur, and said, Hagar, Sarah's servant, where did you come from and where are you going? She said, from Sarah, my mistress, I'm running away. The Lord's messenger said to her, go back to your mistress, put up with her harsh treatment of you. The Lord's messenger also said to her, I will give you many children, so many they can't be counted. The Lord's messenger said to her, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You will name him Ishmael because the Lord has heard about your harsh treatment. He will be a wild mule of a man. He will fight everyone and they will fight him. He will live at odds with all his relatives. Hagar named the Lord who spoke to her. You are El Roy, because she said, Can I still see after he saw me? Therefore, that well is called Beer Kaha Roy. It's the well between Kadesh and Bered. Hagar gave birth to a son for Abraham, and Abraham named him Ishmael. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar gave birth to Ishmael for Abram. Thank you. What do you notice? I bet this is starting to sound familiar. Yeah, what do you notice? What jumps out at you? What seems, what seems weighty to you in the hearing of this today? Yeah, Bill. This is nothing profound, but you will be a wild mule of a man. Yeah. Yeah, a wild mule of a man. Yeah, some translations give us a wild ass of a man. Yeah, I've, I've never tried to domesticate a wild mule, but I get the impression they kick a lot, and it's not easy. Yeah, yeah. What a great visual image, yeah. What else? What else? What's it like to hear that your child is going to be like that, right? You know, yeah, yeah. Anyway, what else do you hear? What seems interesting to you? Yeah, Sally. I just think it's interesting she's going to have so many children they can't be counted. Yes, which reminds us of what? The promise to Abraham, right? You know, so even if, and we'll see, we won't see, but if you read chapter 17 and beyond, you'll, you'll, you'll find out that, uh, that actually God makes it clear, at least in our tradition, God makes it clear to Abram that Sarai is going to be the mother of his offspring, uh, so we, we know that's going to come. And yet here now we see that the promise that was made to Abraham is, if not being fulfilled, being translated or shared or duplicated for Hagar and her descendants. Yeah. Yeah, I think we forget that. I think for, we forget that the promise God made to Abraham, God is now making to Hagar. Um, it's, and it's not just a consolation prize, which is, I think, how we often hear it. Yeah. What else do you notice? There's some of this that makes me sort of uncomfortable as I think about how easily pieces of this can be quoted in a way that is really harmful. Mm -hmm. um, I particularly noticed the verse about going back to Abram um, and putting up with the harsh treatment, um, putting up with Sarai's harsh treatment. It seems like something that would be really easy to take out of context and tell someone they need to go back to an abuser. Yeah. Because yeah. of a child. Absolutely. Absolutely. And how often, especially, do religious figures do that, mm -hmm. right? Your first obligation is to your marriage and to your spouse. Uh, be quiet, submit, and, and deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that becomes very dangerous uh, language. Yeah, and it's, it's God's messenger who seems to be saying that. Yeah. Yeah. What else? Yep. Sure. Hold on a second. Yeah, I have a question. So um, is this supposed to be a motivator or something when he said he'll be a wild mule of a man, he'll fight everyone, they will fight him? That sounds pretty negative. Of us. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's, you know, stories like this get told because, because we remember them later on and it makes sense, right? So, you know, if... if um, if your, if, if your parent had a really difficult labor with you, but you turn out to be a really sweet person, then we stop telling the story about the difficult labor, 
But if your mother had a really difficult labor with you and you turn out to be difficult your whole life long, then we, then we remember that story and we tell it and we say, you know, I should have known from the beginning that this child was going to be, this child was difficult in my womb, right? And so um, Ishmael historically becomes a figure who is combative, who is, who is difficult, um, who can't seem to keep anybody happy. And, and, and whether, and I, this is a line from the sermon today, though it, it fits here as well, whether the prophecy is what creates the results or the results that help us hear the prophecy, either way, they, they certainly go together. So the, the, there's not much of a historical record of Ishmael, but certainly presented to us here in the biblical text that he's, he's going to be, be a fighter. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the, um, the Hadith, or maybe it's the Quran, I think it's the Hadith, the, some of the sacred uh, Islamic writings mention to us that Ishmael becomes a skillful sort of martial artist. He becomes a skilled with a bow, not only as a hunter, but as a warrior. Um, so, yeah, so there's a sense in which he's, he's going to be a fighter, yeah, for his whole life. Isaac has a different role to play, yeah, the other child, yeah. Yeah, what else do you notice? Yeah, George. I think what Camus said, you're either in a state of rebellion or in a state of grace. Huh. And um, that becomes difficult for the person who wants to be in a state of grace but is actually born to not be in that state of grace. Um, it may not be because of uh, that he's a bad person, but sometimes he may see what's right and fight for it when everybody else doesn't. So, or on the other hand, he may just be a terrible person. But that's um, an interesting problem with, as a Christian because you really, we, you try to support these, the established art as much as you can because that's what gives life sense and gives civilized society. And at the same time, you speak out against what, uh, what's wrong, what you think's wrong. And we have that problem of my generation, uh, 60s and 70s, when it was, it becomes fashionable to be rebellious. And uh, I even saw an, an ad the other day of um, some gloves, and they were ruthless gloves, or no mercy gloves. It's, you know, it's just, we have to be all in rebellion. So you have generations that are all considered as fashionable to be rebellious, and you have the previous generation, which I admire greatly, uh, which were fashionable to do the community thing. In other words, to, in, to invest yourself in the community and to give yourself to the community. Now that's, uh, for a while more, that's uh, anathema. You have to be an individual. We're taught woman or man, you have to be an individual and creative artist. If there's art, it has to be new. It has to, everything has to be new. Otherwise, it's senseless. And that, that is, of course, going to change eventually. But as a Christian, that's a, that's a, a problem hmm. to balance it. Yeah. Notice that, and I, I mentioned this, I think, in the description of this series, notice that Hagar named the Lord. She's the only human being to name God in the Bible. The only one. The only time it ever happens. Not Abram. Not Isaac. Not Jacob. Not any of the patriarchs. Not Adam. Not Enoch. Not none of those people. Only Hagar. 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 Hagar names God. What does it mean to name God? Right? God's name is, is, is that which cannot be owned. Right? I, I am, the great I am. The reason we sort of put Lord in, in small caps there is to help us know that it conveys the ineffable proper name of God. Um, if I know your name, I have power over you. Remember, um, you know, the, you know if, you're, if you are in a position to give somebody a nickname... You're in a position of power over them. Um, you know, Jacob wrestles with the angel and says, tell me your name. And the angel, God says, why do you want to know my name? Um, refuses to even speak it. And yet Hagar, Hagar names God, El Roy. Um, what? That's a, it's, it's really bizarre. Uh, and it's just amazing, um, which helps me hear this passage differently. Instead of, you know, there, there are different ways that we can if you will, get rid of Hagar. We'll see next week that we've, we've got to get rid of Hagar and Ishmael. Otherwise, Abram's covenant and inheritance is going to be split. So we've we got to write them out of the story. Just like if you're writing a, a soap opera or a sitcom, 
and somebody has a contract dispute, you're going to write them out of the story. They're either going to get hit by a bus or die or who knows what. We've got to get them out of the story. But if the only thing we needed to do was get them out of the story, then you just write them off, right? You don't bother with this part. You say, Abram said, treat her the way you want. She ran away and she was never heard from again. The end. But the fact that we not only preserve her story, but also give her this identity, the only one, the only one to ever name God, that tells us that if we're thinking of Hagar as an afterthought, we're missing something. There's more, there's more to her story uh, than that. There's more to her than that. Um, some things for you to reflect on as we, as we wrap up, and I want to make sure I give time for your sort of uh, uh, closing thoughts. Notice that the angel says, Hagar, Sarai's servant. Like, you know, um, imagine if someone came up to you and said, hey, Evan's wife, or hey, George's wife, or hey, hey, Rebecca's husband. I mean, you know, just, just and not only that, not only spouse, but servant, right? You know, what, what's it like to be identified by that? Even, even in this text, God's voice is identifying Hagar in terms of her servile relationship with a Sarai. Um, Big, deep, difficult questions about why does God ask Hagar to return and submit to this harsh treatment? What, what are we supposed to understand about that? Um, what kind of model is that for us? Not only in terms of Hagar, but also in terms of God. What kind of model is it that one would say that? Um, notice that it seems to be an angel, but then later on, um, the angel seems to uh, speak in the first person on behalf of God. So remember in the Bible... Whenever we see a messenger, the messenger speaks as if God, God's self were speaking. So, uh, so, so uh, don't get hung up in that. Um, uh, notice that the language is very much an, an enunciation, right? This is the first time an enunciation has been given to a woman in the Bible. Um, there will be other times when God shows up and announces something to a woman, uh, most notably to Mary in Luke's account of the gospel, but... This is God showing up to Hagar. God doesn't say, Abram, go find Hagar and tell her that everything's going to be okay. God goes straight to Hagar. I think that's important, and I think we often miss it. Um, I've asked the question, is it possible for us to understand that Hagar has become equal to Abram? Just as Abram is a patriarch, the patriarch, in some ways Hagar is the matriarch of of the Ishmaelites, of, of her descendants. So I wonder if as the annunciation and the promise of more children than you can count is spoken and translated uh, to Hagar, I wonder if in a sense, just as she had taken Sarai's place, I wonder if now she's taking Abram's place, at least in terms of the divine human relationship. Um, We've talked about the naming a little bit. Um, uh, Elroy, um, God has seen me, I have been seen, the one who sees and the one I have seen. all of the prayers that are written about Hagar seem to revolve around, around being seen. Uh, she is the one who is seen, the one who is heard. I think that's uh, significant for us. Um, the last thing I want to say before we look at that next bit of text is notice, notice for whom Hagar gives birth in verse 15, right? And 16, right? She gives birth to a son for Abram. Sarah is the one saying maybe she'll give a birth, maybe she'll give birth to a child for me. But, but I wonder if there's a sense in which there's a clarification about the relationship between Abram and Hagar in a way that the Bible almost doesn't have room for, but just gives us a little shred of this. And so this child is not Sarai's child. It's Abram and Hagar's child. It, in effect, legitimizes the relationship between Abram and Hagar. Um, it's still, she's still a slave. She's still property the Bible and the story still denies her her full identity. But I wonder if in at least small measure, the fact that, and the Bible knows what it's doing, right? In the same way that Sarah was hoping for a child for her, the way the story finishes, at least this chapter, is the son is for Abram. So there's a connection between Hagar and Abram, not Sarah. Sarah, in a sense, has been written out of the text in this point. Um, all right, thoughts and reflections. I'll close with a bit from, uh, from Exodus in a minute. But what about you? What do you... What are you hearing? What are you noticing? What are you thinking? What are you wondering as we finish this first of two classes on Hagar? Are you hearing her differently? There's, there's a lot to talk about for Hagar. She's a, she's a rich character in Sarai too, but 
um, in many of the patriarchal stories, the women are more interesting than the men. The, the women have more to teach us about human nature and about who God is than the men, even though the men are usually in the spotlight. The, Hagar, there's a lot here. You could write epics about Hagar. Yeah. Reflections or thoughts about Hagar. Well, I've invited you to be thinking about the relationship between Hagar and Sarai and between Israel and Egypt. And let me read for you Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 through the first part of verse 11. Um, this will, I hope, sound familiar to you, but also notice the, the, the similarities in what's, uh, in what's being described. Uh, now, verse 8, a new king came to power in Egypt who didn't know Joseph. He said to his people, the Israelite people are now larger in number and stronger than we are. Come on, let's be smart and deal with them. Otherwise, they'll only grow in number. And if war breaks out, they'll join our enemies, fight against us, and then escape from the land. As a result, the Egyptians put four men of forced work gangs over the Israelites to harass them with hard work. The harassing with hard work is the same way that Sarai treats her servant. So if we were to hear this in the Hebrew and we were to read all the way from Genesis through Exodus, I think it would be hard for us to hear these words and not remember the way Sarai treated Hagar. And so just as Hagar the Egyptian is being abused by Sarai her mistress, a few generations later, Egyptians will be abusing the Israelites um, I don't mean to suggest that turnabout is fair play or what goes around comes around. That is not the message. But instead, it helps me hear a little bit about the humanity of Hagar. Hagar bore first the same suffering and hardship of God's people later. And I, I bet if we heard this in the Hebrew and, and really knew our Bibles better, I bet if, if I knew my Bible better, when I heard the story of Hagar, I would think not of the Zenos, not of the stranger, not of the foreigner, but I would hear even more fully the, the, the deep identity of God's people, those who were enslaved and who were set free. And that way, Hagar becomes a matriarch for them as well. Next week, we will look at another chapter of the Hagar story after the birth, and she's sent off. So there's more to read about from Hagar, Ishmael, and Isaac. So I hope you'll come back. Thank you all for being with us, and I'll see you next week.